Oh, you just tuned in to see me juggle some Ryzen boxes, didn't you? Yeah. It's July 7th, 2020. That means new Ryzen CPUs are launching. Yes, the XT series. First time we've seen XT in a CPU, but yeah, that's that's something we'll talk about. 4.7 gigahertz, 4.7 gigahertz across the board. Well, I mean, the 3600 XT, it's an overclock, but yeah, have I got your attention? Good. It's been exactly a year since the Ryzen 3000 series launched, and today, three new, faster CPUs are added to the Ryzen 3000 lineup, the XT series. On the box, they're just 100 megahertz faster with the maximum boost clock, except for the 3800X, which is 200 megahertz faster, but uh, is that all that there is? Is that, is that what this whole thing is for? Well, what about a 4.7 gigahertz 3600 XT with an overclock? I'll get there, but let's start at the beginning. This is the first time we've seen the XT moniker on CPUs from AMD, just GPUs previously, like the 5700 XT. We've got the 12 core 3900 XT, we've got the 8 core 3800 XT, and we've got the Ryzen 5 3600 XT for testing. Now to be clear about two things. First, that AMD has said this is not about binning. No, uh, it's actually about the TSMC process. So process improvements from TSMC and an improved new seven nanometer process is what is delivering these faster clock bump CPUs in the same power envelope, which is my second point. You know, better power characteristics, better power improvements. Yes, the, the wattage, you know, the TDP, for whatever that's worth, has not changed. 95 watts for the 3600 XT and 105 watts for the 12 core and the eight core. Now, might this be a dry run to get a new seven nanometer process for processors that might be launching later this year, such as Ryzen 4000? Yes, could be. So let's get right to it. Let's get to the 3600 XT testing, which I think is the star of the show. Sure on the box, our 3600 XT is only on 100 megahertz clock bump, but that's just, the turbo frequency, it's not even the base frequency, but that's not really all that's going on here when we sort of dig into it. It boosts higher and for longer, and the Infinity Fabric is stable at 1900 megahertz. Yeah, you can run 3800 megahertz memory, at least I could on all three CPUs, and we'll talk more about that. So the direct comparison here is to an Intel 10600K, Intel's 10th generation six core. It's still on a 14 nanometer process, and Intel certainly has done Herculean things to manage the thermals from the uh, power usage of that 14 nanometer chip. It's definitely an improvement over ninth gen. That's pretty awesome. Now, our Intel 10600K is cooled by a modest $40 aluminum Be Quiet Pure Rock 2 single fan. It's an open air test bench configuration. There's nothing really crazy here, but five gigahertz is easily attainable on this configuration. And when compared to the 3600X, well, the Intel CPU leaves the 3600X far, far behind. Now, how likely is it that someone would be using an expensive GPU with like a 2080 Ti with the 3600X? Uh, not super likely, but we're, we're gonna do that for testing and for science. Can the 3600 XT beat or at least match the Intel 10600K knowing that the 3600X is that much slower? And the short answer is no. But it does get interesting and it does get really close and we can overclock it. So, you know, the fat lady has not sung yet. Now on games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we can see that the 3600X will perform at around 125 FPS at 1080p high with a 2080 Ti. That's with the latest drivers, Windows 2004, some performance tuning on both the Intel and the Ryzen system, you know, the Ryzen power plan, the appropriate Ryzen power plan for gaming, et cetera, et cetera. Now look at the XT. Ooh, 140 FPS right out of the box. The 3600 XT at stock closes the gap by 12 FPS. And we can tweak things with the Infinity Fabric and get up to 142 FPS. Yeah, 3600 XT maximum 142 FPS with a little bit of memory tuning. Now everything else being equal, the Intel i5 10600K system, same memory, everything else, it's gonna be about 100 to $150 more expensive. The CPU is about $50 more expensive, plus you gotta get a cooler. Plus it seems like the Z490s, Apple to Apple motherboard comparison, they're a little bit more expensive, but it is hard to do the price comparison with uh, the global situation that we're in, in terms of supply chain, supply and demand. There's a lot of price fluctuation, but it seems to me that the Intel platform is $100 to $100, $150 more expensive, getting as close as I can apples to apples. 
And with our apples to apples system in just this one game, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we can see that we're getting 160 FPS out of our 2080 Ti. That is an incredible frame rate. I mean, that's just, that's, that's, it's incredible. It's an incredible frame rate. It is, it is an achievement. Now here's where things get interesting. I've got this 3800 megahertz memory. It's G-Skill, Trident Z memory running CL14. It is blisteringly fast. Few Ryzen CPUs that I've tested up till now have a truly stable Infinity Fabric at 1900 megahertz, but these new XT CPUs, all of them can manage 1900 megahertz just fine. So my 3800 megahertz memory runs at the optimal two to one memory to Infinity Fabric uh, clock speed ratio. Also, bumping up the cooler to a Scythe Fuma 2, which is a relatively inexpensive cooler. Oh, we can squeeze a little bit more performance out of this. Look at this, Shadow of the Tomb Raider revisiting it here. This is the same performance that I get on my 3950X. It's just a few more FPS faster. That's also a 4.7 gigahertz and a toasty 78 degrees C on a Scythe Fuma. Now the boost behavior on the XTs is a little different than the Xs. The boosts stay there a little bit longer and uh, they're a little bit less fleeting. And I will say that my 3600 XT seemed to be more overclockable percentage-wise than the other two, but you know, six cores versus 12 cores, the 3900 XT with less of an overclock is gonna make up for less of an overclock with just sheer numbers of cores. So bear that in mind. Out of the box, the performance of either of those CPUs is on par with the 3950X. That's a $750 AM4 CPU, 16 core. For gaming, gaming doesn't really use 16 cores, but it does, you know, Previously, the 3950X was the only one with that 4.7 gigahertz clock, but here it is. Now it's available on at least two other CPUs right out of the box. So you will get that in games. Now here's one odd thing, not really odd, but the 3800 XT is a single chiplet. It's a single eight core chiplet. And as we saw in the benchmarks on the 3300X, there is some benefit from that kind of a CCX layout inside the chip. So the 3300X has shockingly high gaming performance. I was kind of expecting that with the 3800X versus the 3900XT, or 3800XT versus the 3900XT. I was kind of, you know, sort of expecting that. But that wasn't really the case. They were, you know, basically on par. And I think that's improvements to Windows 2004, the scheduler, the driver, Ryzen power plan, sort of most things know how to work. There's a couple exceptions and we'll talk about that, but generally it's okay. Now, if we step down from the admittedly not realistic 2080 Ti to something a little bit more reasonable, like a 2070 Super, which is still pretty high end, the lead that Intel has is almost completely eliminated. Or on the 2080 Ti, step up to resolutions like 1440p or 4K, and again, that lead disappears or is dramatically reduced. It's a similar story with other games that we've tested in our lineup. Games like Borderlands 3, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon, Far Cry 5. Far Cry 5 is one of those games that's always been really hinky on AMD systems, and there've been some tweaks to the game and stuff like that to help, but it's really down to optimization. Is the Intel system worth the extra $100 to $150 premium for you? Well, that's up to you. I mean, that's a premium cost. But we've also got new B550 motherboards coming out, which may change the price equation yet again. So it's up to you. Me personally, I think I would get more enjoyment out of setting the extra money on fire. Let's talk about productivity. For productivity, it's a, a different story. I mean, AMD was already doing really well here. We can look at a cross section of all three of these CPUs. All three of these CPUs, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying a little bit, are about 5% more across the board more efficient or more performant. Uh, and that's at the same power. That's an out of the box configuration, no overclock, nothing like that. Ran renders for 24 hours on the 3900X and the 3900 XT. And the 3900 XT completed those renders significantly faster. So a reduction in overall energy usage to complete a job. It's pretty awesome. And when you measure that way, you can do a little better than 5% actually. On all core workloads at stock settings, with 3,800 megahertz memory, I was seeing, you know, 100 to 150, 200 megahertz all core clock increase sustained. And again, that's sort of fungible because if you plot that, you would think that you would get a little bit more performance. Things like Geekbench show significantly higher single thread performance, and that's pretty awesome overall because that's you know one of the benchmarks that a lot of people use technically stock for stock the xt cpus report significantly higher single core performance than the 10 600k in many benchmarks including geekbench and cinebench and things like that but unfortunately toggling something on like multi-core enhancement or just overclocking that 10 600k to 5 gigahertz well i mean you can score 1400 
on Geekbench without Geekbench v5 without really trying. So it's sort of an odd situation. With stuff that lives entirely inside the CPU, AMD has taken the single thread crown from Intel. The single thread performance out of the box with these three CPUs versus the 10600K, uh, the, the AMD CPUs seem to be winning with those types of benchmarks. And for overclock versus overclock, for what it's worth, and with an auto OC, I was staying, I was seeing stable clocks as high as 4.775 on the 3800 XT and the 3900 XT. The 3600 XT would not clock quite as high, but I could usually get the 3600 XT reliably to 4.675 and with really good cooling, 4.7. Maybe, I'm comfortable saying 4.675, but I could do 4.75 without crashing in most things. I also found the manual overclock experience on these XT CPUs to be better than my past experiences with AMD CPUs. So that's something to explore in a future video. But overclocking, again, things did get interesting. With the 3900 XT, I was able to overclock chiplet one, because remember it's a two chiplet system, two six core chiplets plus the IO die. I was able to overclock that primary chiplet to 4.675 gigahertz on all cores and chiplet two to 4.5 gigahertz with a max voltage of 1.4 volts. That seems pretty cherry, at least given past experience. Out of the box watching hardware info, it looks to me like it's the same setup as the 3900X where you have one of the really good chiplets that's always clocking really high and the other chiplet is not quite clocking as high. Now there's less of a performance delta between chiplet one and chiplet two, I think, on the 3900XT than the 3900X, but there's still a little bit of a delta there, at least in stock configurations. Now, going back to my overclock, 152 FPS on the 3900XT with my manual overclock, but not pushing the chip super, super hard. Not with the 1.4 volts, that's just with auto OC and letting auto OC do its thing and seeing 4.725, 4.675, basically out of the box, but with my 3800 megahertz memory. That's within eight FPS of our 10600K. That is pretty nuts. Now, if we switch to productivity workloads for the 3900 XT and the 3800 XT, overclock means a 10 to 12% performance uplift in benchmarks like Indigo, and that's just you know what you're gonna see because it's a workload that scales really well to multiple cores. Cinebench, Blender, pretty much anything that's not just intentionally stressing the CPU like a Prime 95 or a, a Super Pi test or something like that. These improvements, especially the 1900 megahertz Infinity Fabric, I think are really noteworthy improvements, but I haven't really been able to succinctly boil them down to a blurb that AMD could put on the side of the box. I guess that's for, for people like me to tell you. So to summarize, with the 3900 XT and with the 3800 XT, I didn't really find nearly as much overclocking headroom as the 3600 XT in terms of percentages, higher clocks, that kind of thing. AMD is ahead of Intel everywhere but gaming, and in gaming, there are teeth marks on Intel's heels, you know, because AMD is nibbling at Intel's heels, like they've actually probably drawn blood. In a lot of scenarios though, it's a wash between Team Red and Team Blue. There are edge cases where a particular game is built for Intel, but mostly that isn't the case anymore because, I mean, let's face it, Ryzen 3000 has taken the world by storm over the last year, and these CPUs are just that much more better. More better, more better. There are a few holdouts, however. Escape from Tarkov, which, you know, is sort of fun. So technically, yes, I guess Intel still has the gaming performance crown with the 10600K and the 10900, but I wanna show you something really interesting before we get into Escape from Tarkov. Crystal Disk Mark. So Crystal Disk Mark is just a disk bench benchmarking program. I'm constantly see on the level one forums is like, oh, my gaming experience on a Ryzen system is smoother. And I can think of one game where that's currently not true, which is Escape from Tarkov, and a little bit Far Cry 5. Now Far Cry 5 is the whole SMT on versus SMT off. Even GTA 5 struggled a little bit with that in the beginning because GTA 5, and then I showed the engine was broken in GTA 5. I'm currently doing a deep dive on Escape from Tarkov to try to understand what its performance hangup is on the AMD side of the world, but it is a smoother experience on Intel systems like a 9900K, even though computationally the 9900K is is inferior to, you know, the 3800XT and, and sort of on up. But it's, it's mostly down to optimization issues, but I, I really wanted to try to quantify what this smoothness thing, so Crystal Dismark. I thought it would be fun to run the Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark while running stuff in the background. And this is something you can do at home. So I ran Crystal Disk Mark, which is not super multi-threaded. It's not gonna make your system super busy, but it will make your disk kind of busy. So use Task Manager to set the priority to low, which means the system should defer that 
if anything else needs stuff. So if you're playing a game and it needs to load a texture or something from your NVMe, it can. So doing this kind of a benchmark where we've got Crystal Disk Mark kind of running in the background, hammering the disk a little bit, but it's only hammering the disk with a little bit of threads, not a lot of threads. I mean, it could bottleneck the disk, but it's running in the background, doing stuff, starting the benchmark at the same time that you start the benchmark inside the game, and doing that on our Ryzen 5 3600 XT system and our Intel 10600K system. Now on our Intel system, it affects our benchmark 8, 10 FPS. In most cases, it's not super repeatable. And then on our Ryzen system, it usually only affects the benchmark one or two FPS. That would seem to lend some credence at least to the whole Ryzen is smoother thing because it's juggling different background processes. Larger caches, chips, chiplet layout, especially on the 3900 XT where some processes can live on the other chiplet and not be disturbed. That's going to lend itself to being able to run background processes better at the larger cache and the, the resources that the system has. It's not a great test though. I would like to sort of test it in a more quantified way. One way that you can test it is by playing a game for a long period of time and just see what happens, which is what I'm currently doing with Escape from Tarkov because it is legit more smooth on an Intel system than an AMD system. And there have been patches over the last few months that have really, really improved the situation for AMD, but it's still not quite there yet. So when I mentioned clock speeds are fungible, what did I mean? Well, look at the Geekbench results. Look at the Geekbench results out of the box stock configuration for a 3900 XT or 3800 XT and our 3600 XT. Yeah, the 3600 XT is a little bit slower, but it's only supposed to be a turbo of 4.5 gigahertz. And yet that doesn't really bear out in the Geekbench results. If you were to plot the values of a 3600 XT running at 4.5, a 3600X running at 4.4, all stock configurations, 3800X, 3800 XT, 3900 XT, 3950X, you would basically expect it to be an, you know, a diagonal line, but it's not really the case. It's basically a flat line and they all perform pretty much the same in sort of this real world Geekbench testing scenario. I mean, it's reporting 4.71 gigahertz, 4.75 gigahertz. So a little bit more than 4.7 gigahertz, basically across the board. That's genuinely very impressive. But it also means that, you know, the specs on the box, it's meaningless. Some of this is gonna be down to silicon lottery. Your CPU might not quite be as good as the ones that I have, or you may have CPUs that are even better than the ones that I have, or you may have rolled a 10 on your CPU thermal paste application, and you'll be in an even better situation than I am because you've got thermal limitations, power limitations, and silicon quality limitations. And you can change some of those, but you can't change all of those. So let's talk about the platforms, Z490 on the Intel system versus X570 and B550 on the AMD side. Although you can run older motherboards like B450, AMD sort of, you know, it's up to board partners, but B450 or, or X470, that's an option. So AMD's platform is, uh, is better. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of an oversimplification, but let's look at it. The AMD platform has a direct PCIe link to the NVMe. It's PCI Express 4 on B550 and X570, and we're seeing uh, PCI Express 4 NVMe sort of come in vogue. AMD's platform uh, is a little bit better th than therefore in terms of I.O. Intel with Z490, their interface to the M.2 is through the DMI link, which is the chipset link. They've been stuck on the same, more or less, DMI interface since Haswell. Now, theoretically, Z490 motherboards support PCI Express 4.0, but Intel has yet to release a PCI Express 4.0 chip that goes with that motherboard. So that may change, but for now, the real reason for Z490 and the 10 series CPUs is power delivery, dumping a lot of power into those CPUs. Now, B550 is not as high end as X570, to be sure, but it's pretty great if you want a motherboard without a chipset fan, and uh, you don't really plan to have a ton of M.2 or a ton of PCIe peripherals. And of course, it costs less, generally, although not universally. There does seem to be a huge variation in board quality, though, on AMD side. I mean, you can have a low-cost X570 and a very expensive B550, and vice versa. I mean, B550 is available from 16 power phases to like 4 plus 1. That's a pretty huge variation. The Intel platform, I think Intel controls a little bit more with an iron fist, and that may be to try to control the end user experience. That may just be how Intel is. I don't know. But like I say, generally to me, it seems like the Z490 motherboards are a little bit more expensive than the equivalent motherboard that you could get to run one of these AM4 CPUs, whatever chipset that happens to be. What about pricing overall? I mean, doesn't it really come down to pricing? I mean, I sort of started the video with like, ah, there's a $100 difference, but 
Yeah, let's talk about pricing of these CPUs. So the 3900X right now, the MSRP is 499, but the street price is about 400. You can pick it up. So there are sales and there's sales for all of these CPUs. 3600X has gone on sale. The 3600 is currently on sale at Newegg at the time that I'm shooting this. Well, the MSRP on the 3900 XT is 499 and 399 for the 3800 XT and 249 for the 3600 XT. That's the same price as launch day for the X counterparts of these CPUs a year ago. It is an interesting choice of AMD to remove the CPU cooler, you know, sort of the 3900X, the, C the cooler that it came with, perfectly fine, as long as you don't plan to overclock or do anything like that. And in general, I don't recommend overclocking on AMD CPUs with the possible exception of your XMP memory profile. And now apparently, 3800. I mean, you can give 3800 a try, and if it doesn't work, you can back off to 3600 with even tighter timings, the Ryzen timing calculator, a lot of fun stuff. So in summary, who is this CPU for? Well, obviously it's not for users of Ryzen 3000. If you've already got a Ryzen 3000 CPU, enjoy it. It's fine. You don't need, you can, you can wait until the next cycle. You'll be fine. This is really for everybody else. I mean, I think there, we're getting so many good CPUs so quickly that it really seems like it's gonna depress the value of the used market. You holdouts on that i7-2600K, yeah, that's a legendary CPU. It's time to let the legend, you know, go gently into that good night and pick up another legendary CPU like the 3900X, T in parentheses, or 3600 XT in parentheses. Either one of those CPUs, or, you know, depending on what your needs are, is an incredible value for what it is. To be sure, the 3900X, 12 cores, my favorite CPU in probably 10 years. 12 cores at a reasonably affordable price, it doesn't break the bank, it comes with a good cooler, you can buy it on an inexpensive motherboard, and you can have an incredible system for basically anything that you would want to throw at it. It really, you know, virtualization, Linux, Linux and Windows at the same time. You can even do the whole VFIO thing on a system like that if you very carefully choose your components. The 3900XT sweetens that a little bit, although now you have to get a cooler, but, I kind of like how quiet the Noctua cooler is, so, but it does make the system overall more expensive. Given that you can get a 3900X for $100 less right now, and that comes with a reasonable cooler, I don't know if I would pick the 3900X or the 3900XT. It's a tough call. $100 is a lot of money. I mean, for your, it's 25% of your processor cost, but it's probably less than 10% of your overall system cost. So 10% more for a little bit more clocks and the system's a little bit more zesty, let's say. I think I would probably go for the Zesty system myself, but it depends on the budget and other constraints. I mean, the 3600, if I'm just gonna game and I'm not gonna be running a ton of virtual machines, the 3600 XT in parentheses is fine. Just depends on if you want that high frame rate gaming. And of course you've got, you know, better than a 60 Hertz monitor to go with it. So in conclusion, competition is alive and well. That's good for the consumer, no matter which platform you pick. There is no real wrong answer here. Okay, well, there, there are a couple of wrong answers, but if you choose your CPU carefully, then all of the other peripherals that go with that, there's not really any wrong answers. If you, you know, do a lot of smart buys, different good components, sort of mix and match and build your own system, it really is exciting. There's never been a better time to build your own machine. Of course, maybe six months from now would be an even more better time to build a machine. I don't know but these CPUs are nice. If you were waiting to get a Ryzen 3000 CPU and you need to have it right now and you can't wait six more months, you would be hard pressed to go wrong with any of these CPUs. You'd be hard pressed to go wrong even with like a 3600. I mean, it just depends on what you're doing. But I'm really impressed that 4.7 gigahertz makes a bigger difference here than you would expect. So bravo, nice job AMD. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out and I'll see you later. Now on games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, crap. Now on games like Shadow, uh, now on games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we can see that the 3900X will perform at around crap. I can't read. It's 